Well, good morning and welcome to Fizz, Fun Interactive Sunday School. And it's only interactive if you give me your feedback, so I hope that you'll do that as we work through these lessons. Today we're continuing in our study in the Gospel of Luke. This is the Exploring the Bible series put out by Lifeway. And uh, we're looking at a title of the lesson is Celebrate. <laughs> it's fun to celebrate, isn't it? Uh, I'm celebrating the fact that I've had my first uh, vaccine for the uh, COVID virus. And uh, the 24th of this month, I'll have my second shot. And then we'll start to feel very comfortable in going back to church in person. Uh, when you reach my age, you don't want to put God to any tests. Uh, and so I've been very cautious to... Uh, try to wear a mask every chance that I can outside in uh, the uh, public places. And I uh, hope that you take as much care as you can. We lost another good friend uh, here on Melrose Mountain uh, to the virus. Uh, he did have some underlying causes uh, for illness, but he was in good health up until he caught the virus. And Unfortunately, with his other underlying causes, the virus was stronger than he was, and uh, it was a good friend and a, a nice neighbor. So uh, please stay safe, and uh, I pray that uh, you'll go back to church as quickly as you can, but not putting your life at risk. Uh, so uh, you use whatever God's direction is for your life, and uh, that's exactly what I did. I asked God about it. He told me what to do, and I hope he'll tell you what to do as well. Uh, we need to be in church. There's nothing like the fellowship of uh, the local body of believers. In case you're uh, just using this to help study your Sunday school lesson, I'm glad you're doing that. If you're using this instead of Sunday school, glad that you're doing that. And we'll continue to do these for a couple more months until everybody's had a chance to have the vaccine and everybody feels safe to go back to Sunday school and church because that's where we ought to be so we can interact in person. Today, as we study Luke, we have to recognize again that it's the largest of the uh, Gospels, all four Gospels. This is the largest. It's the only one written by a Gentile, a non-apostle. Uh, Luke, Dr. Luke writes not only the Gospel of Luke, but also the book of Acts. We wrote approximately 62 to 64 um, A.D. Uh, however, the events that he's recording here uh, go back to approximately 29 A.D. and the winter months. So this is approximately A.D. 29 that he's writing about an event that occurred then in approximately the winter months. There's 125 to 150 different events recorded in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, Many of those are duplicated or have parallel passages in at least one other gospel, which gives great uh, credibility to the writings of Luke and wrote because he used eyewitnesses to be sure that everything that he gave us was accurate. He uses a lot of parables. Uh, we have 27 parables in the gospel of Luke, uh, and I believe 17 of those are unique to Luke. Uh, Jesus used parables widely in his teaching ministry. And uh, it, again, today, that's the focus of our particular section of scripture is a parable. Uh, but I think you do yourself a disservice if you don't go back and read everything from chapter 13 through chapter 15. And so we take a look at the uh, text in full context and uh, then we'll pull it apart into individual passages. So he got up and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, felt compassion for him, ran, embraced him, and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in your sight I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, and sandals on his feet. And bring the fattened calf, kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. 
for this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found, and they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard the music and the dancing, and he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he became angry and was not willing to go in, and his father came out and began pleading with him. But he answered and said to his father, Look, for so many years I have been serving you, and I have never neglected a command of yours, yet you have never given me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when, his, when this son of yours came, who devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. But, he had, but we had to celebrate and rejoice, for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has been found. You can see that it's very, very important to be able to answer the 10 questions that I'm going to ask that you go back and read from chapter 13 through chapter 15. But particularly, you have to read all of chapter 15. Uh, you notice that uh, when we see this story, we know that there are other parables told in chapter 15. And many of the questions that I gave you deal with not just this one parable that we've read. Now all the tax gatherers and sinners were coming near to him to listen to him. Both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Well, here are your ten questions for the March 14th study in the Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter 15. And the title of the message is Celebrate. Uh, here are the 10 questions that you need to be looking for the answers as you study chapters 13 through chapter 15. Where geographically was Jesus for this event? Where geographically was Jesus for this event? Question number two, who was there at the event? Who were the people that were at this event? Name them. Question number two, name the people at the event. Question number three, what is a parable? Should have gotten that from last week. Question number four. Jesus told many parables in chapters 14 through 19. Here he told how many about lost things. How many lost things parables did Jesus tell in chapter 15? That's question number four. How many lost things did Jesus teach? In chapter 15. Question number five. What are the lost things that Jesus taught about? What are the lost things that Jesus taught about? Question number six. What two things are there in common in the parables that are found in chapter 15? What are two things that are common in the parables of the lost things in chapter 15? Two common things. Question number seven. Whose property, whose property were the calf, the robe, the sandals, and the ring? Whose property were the calf, the robe, the sandals, and the ring? that were given to the younger son. Question eight. Why must you read verse two to understand the central point of Jesus' teaching in this event? Why must you read verse two in order to understand the central point of Jesus' teaching in this event? That was question number eight. Question number nine. What three things should you learn about God from this parable? 
what three things should you learn about God from this parable? Question number 10. How do you think the event ends with the elder son? How do you think the event ends with the elder son? Question number 10 was, how do you think the event ends with the elder son? Well, we've answered a number of our questions already just by going back and reading the beginning of chapter 15. Where are we geographically? Well, if you read all around chapter 11 and following, and then you look at some of the other gospels and you try to figure out where this particular event takes place, it's apparent that he's set his face towards Jerusalem and that he's actually there or thereabouts. So we can probably safely say he's either in Judea or Perea uh, for this particular event. And uh, that's the geographic location. Whether he was in a house or whether he's in a synagogue, we don't know, but we do know who the people were that were at this event. Uh, we, we know that it was likely either a house or just in a general area of teaching because there were tax gatherers and sinners and uh, likely they wouldn't have been at the temple for the synagogue. Uh, but we know that the tax gatherers and the sinners were there. We also know that there were Pharisees and scribes there and they were grumbling. And it was because of the grumbling that we know why Jesus told this parable. They were grumbling about the facts that Jesus was having uh, relationships with these tax gatherers and sinners that they felt they shouldn't associate with them. And here, the central theme of this particular parable or series of parables is about rejoicing because sinners come to Christ. Rejoicing because sinners come to Christ. Uh, and they were grumbling about sinners coming to Christ. Sometimes I wonder if that doesn't happen in our churches today. Uh, we have people that grumble because somebody comes in that's not like us. Uh, maybe they dress differently, or maybe their skin color is different, or maybe they just don't come from the same social class that you think you belong to. Uh, we should always rejoice when sinners and tax gatherers come into our midst. Uh, we are all sinners and fall short of the glory of God. We're all brothers and sisters, and particularly if we've accepted Christ, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. And we need to put away prejudice and bias about other people. So we see the question about where he was, we see who was there, and we see that his thrust of this particular parable is uh, because we should be celebrating uh, about sinners and tax gatherers that come to Christ. What is a parable? Well, it's a short story that has a moral application. And here in this particular parable, we see that uh, even our lesson writer has pointed out at least two significant moral lessons for us. And we can see that he's making some insinuations about who the father is and who these sons are. Uh, and we're going to be looking at that as we pull apart this particular parable. Uh, well, this may be a familiar parable to most of those that are watching this, but maybe not to all. And so I think it's very wise for me to share with you uh, that this is a parable about a farmer uh, who had two sons. And these two sons were totally different. The younger son... Uh, is wanting to grab hold of the world and get away from the farm and set out on his own. Uh, the older son is one that seems to be very faithful to his father and is working on the farm. So let's take a look and uh, see some of the verses that are not in the lesson book, uh, but are very important to understanding this parable. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me a share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. In the day of Jesus, and the Jewish custom was that the 
eldest son, the firstborn, would get two-thirds uh, upon his inheritance, and that the uh, other children, uh, or in case of just two, the other child would get one-third. Uh, but it's really quite interesting because, you see, an inheritance was just as it is today. You didn't usually get your inheritance until the father was dead. And this father was very much alive. But this son was very impatient. He wanted his inheritance and he wanted it now. Sounds like a TV commercial, doesn't it? Not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country, and there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now, when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began to be impoverished. Well, the text goes on to tell us that things got so bad that he was actually taking care of somebody's pigs. Now, for a Jew, taking care of pigs was a very, very defiling kind of an activity. And not only that, but he was so hungry and he had no more finances uh, that he's working with the pigs. Even the pig's food looked good to him. Let's take a look at the next couple of verses. But when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I am dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. If that were all the detail that we have of this particular parable, we'd be in deep trouble because many times people uh, can't realize that they're in a bad problem and want to bail themselves out and they uh, may make promises they don't keep. We call it foxhole religion. Uh, there's a lot of people that turn to God during crisis, and then when the crisis is over, they go right back to the same way that they were living before the crisis instead of fulfilling the pledges that they make to God. But that's not the case for this particular parable, so let's continue with this event. So he got up and came to his father, but while he was still a long way away off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. I'm always impressed at this part of this parable because not only does the son keep the pledge that he made, that he's going to return and admit to his father, that he sinned both against heaven and against his father. Uh, but when he has an opportunity to see that his father is so glad to see him, that he runs to him, embraces him and kisses him even before he makes an admission of guilt, that he has an easy out to not go ahead and tell his father that he sinned and not to say, I'm not worthy to be called your son. It's quite an impressive thing. This is also a good place for me to uh, tell you about the other parables, if you haven't read those, uh, that are here about the lost. We have a lost uh, sheep, a lost coin, and a lost son. It's interesting, isn't it? Uh, we have three things that are lost, and that answers one of our questions. Uh, the sheep is interesting. It's one out of 99 sheep that are lost. But out of the coins, it's one in 10 that is lost. And with the sons, it's one in two that are lost. Notice that the lostness goes from one in 99 down to one in two. There's another interesting thing about these three parables about lost things. The value of a sheep was about $75. The value of the lost coin was four times that much. Uh, about four days wages versus one day's wages. The lost son, priceless. You can't put a value on a son or a daughter. Uh, here we see then this accumulating value and the odds going from one in a hundred to one in 10, to one in two. Interesting, isn't it? The 
three parables about lost things. The value increases, the odds increase, and we find that there is some other commonalities. Well, let's wait on that. Let's come back to that question about what's common about these three parables about lost things. But the father said to his slaves, quickly bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead, but has come back to life again. And he was lost and has been found and they began to celebrate. Well, we've answered question number four, how many lost things were told in the parables uh, here in chapter 15 is three lost things, sheep, coins, and son. And we certainly know that Jesus taught about these three things. Uh, but it's interesting because I also ask you the question about whose robe, whose calf, whose sandals, and whose rings. And it's really kind of a trick question. Uh, because on first blush, you might say, well, he'd already given a third of his estate to the younger son, which was all he was entitled to, according to Jewish custom. And that meant that the other two thirds were his elder brothers. And that's true, but it's not quite true, is it? Because you see, the father still wasn't dead. The father was still living. And these things were still his. They were his to give. And we might say that the elder brother was justified in being angry because the, after all these sandals and this ring and this robe uh, and the fatted calf was really the elder brother's. And in some respect, it certainly was. But in other respects, it wasn't. Because you see, what is mine is mine until I give it away to somebody else or until somebody else inherits it when upon my death. So these were his to give. I think it's false to say that they were the elder brother's possessions, even though they would have been someday. And right now, they still belong to the father. And the father had every right to give whatever he wanted to to the son beyond what was the normal custom of giving. What is ours is ours to do with what we care to do with it. And I think that's particularly important as we start to look at the who the characters represent. But let's take a look at the rest of this parable. Now his older son, who was in the field, when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. And he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. I think there's a couple of things worthy of note here. First of all, the fact that, that they didn't have microwaves in that day and age. Uh, the fatted calf was being slaughtered and was having to be cooked, and it was going to take several hours. Uh, this younger brother who had come home was probably filthy dirty from being with the pigs, and in tattered clothes, uh, had to wash up and get on the robe and the ring. And so the brother that is coming home from the field, the elder brother, likely had put in his full day's work and it was getting towards dinner time. Uh, but he heard something a little bit different than usual. Instead of just hearing a quiet house as the meal was being prepared, he heard a party going on, a celebration, uh, dancing, and he wanted to know what was going on. So he asked the servant. The servant told him. But I think there's another thing that I want you to watch carefully as you go back and read this text over and over. Notice how it talks about your brother, your father's son. And watch the transition uh, as this elder brother reacts to the fact that his brother has come home safe and sound. But he became angry and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began pleading with him. But he answered and said to his father, Look, 
For so many years I have been serving you, and I have never neglected a command of yours, and yet you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when his son, when this son of yours came, who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. I'm sure you noticed the change in whose son this was and whose brother this was and the accusation that's made by the inference. Uh, this brother of yours has come home safe and sound. And then the elder son says, this son of yours, not my brother. Now, you can understand you can understand the feelings of this elder brother. He's been faithful. He's worked hard. And he's never disobeyed his father. Whereas his brother was rebellious, demanding his inheritance before his father was even dead. And now, after squandering it all away on loose living, he's come home and he's being honored. When this elder brother feels neglected, he feels that preferential treatment has been given to his younger brother and uh, that he's not appreciated at all. I think that we can relate to that. And particularly if you say to yourself that everything that's there left on the farm is really going to be inherited by the elder brother, that he could have even felt that what was given to his younger brother was really his. And what a terrible thing to not only not be appreciated, but to have things that were going to be his given away to somebody else who didn't deserve it, who had lived a riotous life, who had done everything that you're not supposed to do as a child. You can certainly understand this elder brother's feelings. It's not any surprise that he was angry. And he said to him, Son, you have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has been found. What was the father saying? He was saying, Son, I haven't disregarded the fact that you've been faithful. You've always been with me. And I realize that you might not feel real appreciated right now, but you ought to celebrate with us because your brother was lost, but he's now found. He was dead, but now he's alive again. I hope that you understand, son. It's not that I don't appreciate you, but we all need to celebrate because my son your brother has come home safely and he was lost but now he's found and that's how the parable ends <laughs> and it's leaving you hanging there saying well what did the elder brother do <laughs> did he go in and join in with the party and celebration or did he stay outside and have a pity party feel sorry for himself Nobody, hate, nobody loves me, everybody hates me, think I'll eat some worms. <laughs> well, let's answer the rest of our questions. What two common things do we find in each of the parables? Uh, in the coins, the sheep, and the sons, what do they have in common? Well, in each of them, they have the fact that something was lost. And in each of them, those things were found. And in each of those, there was a celebration, a celebration over the lost that are found. That's good, isn't it? it? It's a wonderful, wonderful message for all of us. Uh, many of you have heard me complain uh, that we get too excited about healings and we don't get excited enough about people coming to Christ. Healings are temporal. Oh, they're wonderful and we ought to celebrate and we ought to thank God and we ought to see the power of God and I don't want to downgrade at all the healing of someone. But we ought to get even more excited 
when a young child, a teenager, an adult, even a senior adult comes forward and gives their life to Christ. We ought to celebrate because that's eternal. It's not temporal. It's not just for a few more years until we all die, but it's eternal. We live forevermore with Jesus in heaven. Yes, we ought to get celebrating. We ought to celebrate any time somebody comes to Christ. And as in these parables, we ought to celebrate when the lost are found. Who do the characters in this parable represent? Well, I hope by now you see clearly that the Father is representative of God. Uh, he's always loving his children. And he's so glad when one that is lost comes to be found. And, and the Pharisees and the scribes that were grumbling about the sinners who were fellowshipping with Jesus, they're represented by the older brother. The older brother is grumbling, not understanding. And you are left with the idea that we don't know what happened to a lot of these Pharisees and scribes who grumbled about Jesus and who didn't see that he was the Messiah. But there is something more that I want to say about that in just a moment. What three things do we learn about God from this particular parable? God is a loving God, and he's always watching for us. He's always wanting us to return to fellowship with him. No matter how far we stray away, he's watching for us to return. And he doesn't take for granted our faithful service. He's aware of it. He knows everything we do and everything that we don't do. He's never going to take us for granted. He's thankful for faithful children, just as he was for the faithful uh, elder son. But please don't miss this, because sometimes we forget that God give us, gives us a free will. He let the younger son go out, rebel against him. Uh, we're not puppets on a string. We have a free will. But even though he lets us sometimes have our way when it's not the best way he's always waiting for us to return i hope that you see that hope that you see some of the times that you rebelled that he could have made you a puppet but he didn't he gave you the free will to make choices and then to recognize that our choices are sometimes wrong and that we come back and say we're not worthy <laughs> we we just ought to be treated like servants but he says, no, I love you. I want to receive you back with celebration. How do you think it ended with this elder brother? Did he go in? Did he stay out and have the pity party? Well, I think since I believe that that represents the Pharisees and the scribes, we know that there were a few. A few in the Jewish tra tradition and custom, like Nicodemus, uh, we know that Joseph of Arimathea, we know some went in and joined in and celebrated those that come to Christ. But we know there are some who continued to grumble and have pity parties, uh, who didn't accept Christ for who he was. It's a great parable. And we know that there are many that are lost. And when they come to Jesus, we ought to celebrate that's what this lesson is all about. Not just grumbling Pharisees, but young elders and all kinds of sons and daughters who come to Jesus. And we ought to celebrate that with all of our hearts and all of our minds and all of our souls that they've come to fellowship with Jesus. God bless you and have a great day.